Good morning. So, there is a show on Netflix called Stranger Things, but I have not seen a single episode of it. Uh, uh, but I do like strange stuff, uh, and my wife can tell you that, and so she thinks I'm strange. But anyway, um, I, uh, I in fact, this clicker will work here. So, and it's not working. Uh, this is not good, and I know it's on. Uh, well, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, too fast. Okay. So there's some strange facts from Ripley's Believe It or Not. Uh, I found that. I, I, I thought this was interesting. Ketchup in the United Kingdom was originally made with mushrooms instead of tomatoes. I did not know that. Uh, if you ever have red food dye, that's made from a beetle, so keep that in mind. And uh, we share about 50% of our DNA with a banana. And so, uh, this is, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, also, uh, according to, uh, uh, I think it's a picture of Popeye there, but for every 24 pounds of canned or frozen spinach, the FDA allows up to 12 millimeters of caterpillars to be in there. I find that a little disturbing. It's also a reason not to eat canned spinach. Uh, watching horror movies can really curdle your blood. In frightening situations like watching a scary film, the body increases production of the blood clotting protein called Factor 8. So, uh, and Alfred Hitchcock once stated that he was so terrified by his own movies that he would never watch them. <laughs> so, I find that interesting. Um, there are a lot of passages in the Bible that many people find baffling or even strange. Um, and in fact, a lot of churches and a lot of pastors will avoid talking about those passages because they are so difficult. But I like to just dive right into them. Uh, I like what one theologian said, if you find a passage in the Bible that's strange, it's probably, or seems strange, it's probably important. And I think it's important to bring the whole counsel of God. And so we're going to look at some, some passages that some people consider to be strange or weird, uh, or some topics that people consider to be strange or weird about the Bible this month. Uh, we're going to talk, among other things, about the Ark of the Covenant and some of the uh, interesting things around that. We're going to talk about some of the miracles in the Bible. We're going to talk about a prophet and some bears, for those of you who know that story. Uh, and, and today we're going to talk about the devil. Uh, and a lot of people find that to be very strange. Now, I want to call your attention to a very interesting conversation that takes place in the Gospel of Matthew. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the 16th chapter, uh, this is when uh, Jesus is asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? And the disciples respond, you know, some say you're this, some say you're that. And, and he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus uh, gives a great uh, uh, message there, you know, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he says, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Great passage, and most of the sermons stop at that part. But the chapter continues. Shortly after this, uh, this great pronouncement by Jesus, uh, we come to this uh, part of the chapter. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, Peter, rebuking Jesus, um, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. <clears throat> now, have you ever had someone come down on you? Maybe you felt they were a little bit harsh, you know. Maybe you felt they went a little bit too far in their reprimand or in their rebuke. Well, imagine being Peter. Imagine being Peter, and, and you get this reprimand, and it's from Jesus, and he associates you with Satan. Now, I, I mentioned the early service, occasionally over the 27 years of my marriage, I've occasionally had some disagreements with my wife, but she's never called me Satan, thankfully, you know, uh, and so I'm glad for that. And, and so, but to be called Satan, it's a very interesting passage, but I believe that what's really happening here is Jesus, remember, is the Son of God. Jesus is in perfect communion with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is attuned to the spiritual warfare going on around him. And so when Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, this isn't going to happen to you, blah, 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 
Jesus understands that Peter is being manipulated by somebody else. That present in that very conversation is not just Peter and the other disciples, but Satan is there in that conversation. And Satan is manipulating Peter. And Peter is allowing it to happen. And so Satan turns and basically rebukes two parties at once. He rebukes Peter because Peter's allowing himself to be used to the devil. But he's speaking really over Peter's head and talking directly to the source of that manipulation, Satan himself. I want to submit to you today that a lot of times, a lot of times, the problems and challenges that you and I face, particularly when it comes to other people, is because there are supernatural forces at work in our world. Supernatural forces that manipulate you and me. We are going to talk today about dealing with the devil. Dealing with the devil. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I come to church, normally, I don't want to talk about the devil. Because when I come to church, I want to worship Jesus and talk about him and focus on him. But I agree with what the great strategist Sun Tzu said, that it's important to know your enemy. And Jesus does spend some time teaching about the devil. The Bible spends some time teaching about the devil. And it's important that we understand and know our enemy so that we know how to deal with him and ultimately, through God's strength, how to defeat him. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, in his letter to the church in Ephesus, he writes this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Let's be clear. The Bible is making very clear to us that we are wrestling against supernatural forces, that there are forces of darkness that are real, and we ultimately are wrestling against them and not against our fellow human beings. It's particularly important, I think, for us as Christians to understand that because the devil will try to stir up Christians against one another. And it's important that we remember who the real enemy is. The real enemy is not us. The real enemy is the forces of darkness that Paul talks about here. Now, this is why Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, and this is our main, main theme verse for today, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, how many of you enjoy watching nature shows with animals and things like that? And I'll ask the same question that I asked the early service. How many of you sometimes, when you have these nature shows and you see the animals chasing, you know, see the lions chasing other animals to eat them, how many of you root for the lion? Okay, all right, all right. And as I said, avoid these people, okay, so because uh, they are troubled. So anyway, um, but Paul uses that illustration, and you've watched these shows before, and you see this zebra or this other animal or whatever kind of get off to the side become vulnerable for not paying attention and here comes the lion and the lion devours that animal lion does so mercilessly without any regard for that animal's feelings the the, the lion does not say i'm really sorry to do this but i'm really hungry and i'm just gonna have to no the lion just comes in and rips the other animal to shreds Paul uses the same imagery, and he says, that's the devil. That's the enemy. The enemy that hates you. He hates you, and he wants to destroy you. And he walks about this earth looking for victims, looking for people to devour. This is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Satan is real. The devil is real. Demons are real, and they are out to destroy you. And as a result, the Bible says that we need to be sober and vigilant. Now, when you study the Greek behind those words, you'll find that to be sober doesn't just mean to be free from the influence of alcohol. We think of that today. To be sober means to be not drinking alcohol, uh, not under the influence, uh, not under the influence of artificial substances like drugs and so forth. That's just part of it. Obviously, you can't be sober if you're under the influence of artificial substances. So it's like that. But it means more than that. To be sober means to be sober-minded. That means 
to be able, listen here, to think rationally, critically, objectively, to be in control of your emotions and your faculties. The opposite of being sober-minded is to be driven by either addictions or emotions. To be driven by addictions or emotions. When you let your emotions take charge and you start thinking out of anger and rage or thinking out of, out of your emotions, when you quote unquote see red or things like that, you are no longer sober-minded. And the Bible says that if you want to be devoured by the lion, if you want to be eaten up, that's the best way to go. Start being driven by addiction or emotion. Jettison your thinking abilities. How many of us, though, today consistently engage in rational thought? Look around society today. How many people today, how many politicians today consistently engage in rational thought and critical thinking? How many drivers on the Beltway you know, engage in this, right? All right, and so this is, this is a problem. Um, and also we're told to be vigilant. Now to be vigilant means to be alert, to be alert and to be on guard and to be persistently and consistently on guard because the devil never sleeps. The devil never sleeps. And oftentimes we let our guard down particularly when we're tired or we're frustrated or we're lonely or whatever, we'll let our guard down and then the devil comes after us like that roaring lion. There are some of those nature shows. I've seen one that's circulated around YouTube and or Facebook and it was basically these two, I forget the animals, but these two prey animals that were fighting and wrestling with each other and this animal comes sneaking up on them and they didn't see the animal because they were focused on each other fighting each other, and then the animal springs, the lion springs on them and devours one of them. And that's, a, that's a perfect illustration of the church today, how Christians can get all bent out of shape and wrestling with each other and ignore the lion, ignore our real adversary. We are to be sober and we are to be vigilant. Unfortunately, as Chuck Missler, he's a late theologian, one of my favorite Bible teachers I love to read, but... Chuck Missler writes, many people are afraid to talk about the source of evil. They might believe in God, but they don't believe in Satan or hell. In fact, their Barna survey I read recently said a third of professing Christians, a third of professing Christians do not believe Satan is real. And this one survey with a wider sampling, uh, says done, this was done in the late 90s, but it's still the numbers are, haven't changed really since then. 62% of Americans agree that Satan is not a living being, but a symbol of evil. Many of you might actually think that. Many of you today sitting here might actually think that Satan is just a symbol, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Satan is a real supernatural being, an intelligent creature, a fallen angel who is out to destroy us. The Usual Suspects is a movie that came out many years ago, and there's a great line in that movie. It says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. One of the best ways the devil tricks Christians and non-Christians alike is he makes people think he doesn't exist. But he does. He's real. Chuck Missler writes, uh, we need to re-examine what we think of as reality. <clears throat> Missler, by the way, is not only, a, re, not only a Bible teacher, but was a retired engineer who was an expert in science, including physics. So just keep that in mind. We need to reexamine what we think of as reality because there is a world far more real than this one. We think of the spiritual as a fuzzy, imaginary place and the solid physical world we can touch as the actual world. It's quite the opposite. This physical world will eventually burn up and disappear. But there is an eternal world that will last forever. That's the real world. Um, now, I'm not an expert scientist, but I, I, I've learned enough to be dangerous, literally. And, uh, and I can tell you that even when you just examine reality itself, 
uh, just reality itself. Number one, there is an illusion of substance and solidity to you and me today. We are all made up of subatomic particles and atoms and molecules and so forth. And if you were to examine that under a microscope, a really intense, powerful microscope, those atoms and molecules are in movement, they're in motion, and there's all kinds of space in between them. And, and so this, this illusion, this, this, this hard substance here really is just, it, it, a lot of scientists are mystified as to how this could be as hard as it is given the subatomic particles that make this up. Some scientists have said it's like we're living in a matrix type world where we're basically part of this giant computer simulation because some of the subatomic particles don't operate like we think they should. But it gets even weirder than that. You see, we know that there are at least three dimensions to reality. That's why we go see 3D movies and things like that. Einstein theorized there was a fourth dimension. That fourth dimension is time. So therefore, science has agreed for many years there was four dimensions to reality. Well, then the physicists came along in the 20th century and said, no, 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 no. The math doesn't work. When we try to compute reality, the math doesn't work, which is four dimensions. So now mainstream physics, I'm talking mainstream, including non-Christians, mainstream scientists will tell you that there are at least 10, if not 11, spatial dimensions to reality. We, in our senses, our five senses, can only access three of them and understand a little bit the fourth one time. But there are many other dimensions that we can't access, but they're there, they're real. And in fact, there's one school of thought within string theory today that says there are as many as 26 other dimensions. 26. I simply want to point out to you that scientists, mainstream scientists, including non-Christian scientists, have confirmed, confirmed, that there is a reality greater than what you and I can experience with our senses. There's more to life than what we can see, hear, touch, taste, and feel. And what mainstream scientists have recently confirmed just in the last 100 years, the Bible has been telling us for 2,000 years. There is a greater reality out there. And the Bible is telling us that in that greater reality, there are angels and demons. There's heaven and hell. All of the stuff that the Bible teaches, ladies and gentlemen, is real. It's real. Evil is real. This is what the founding fathers would call a self-evident truth. I shouldn't have to prove to you that evil is real. Unfortunately, in this day and age where we've been to, gotten into postmodernism and stuff, many people believe that evil is a human construct. You know, I would agree human beings have a lot to do with evil, <laughs> but it is not a made-up social construct. Evil is real. Now, the causes of sin and suffering, according to the Bible, according to the Bible, the causes of sin and suffering are, number one, fallen angels. Fallen angels, starting with Lucifer, the devil himself, and all the third of the angels that he took with him. So fallen angels, the devil and his demons. And then fallen people didn't take long for sin to work its way into the human race, starting with Adam and Eve. So people are fallen. James writes about this later and says, from wh where do wars and fighting and all that come from? They come from your own lusts. John talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. <clears throat> sin drives us to do evil things. Our sin nature corrupts us. The fallen world, because of sin, the earth has been cursed. Because of that, you have... Pain and childbirth, go back to the Garden of Eden. You have to work hard to live because the ground, the earth itself, no longer cooperates like it once did. So you've got disease and earthquakes and, and all kinds of tsunamis and all kinds of other problems and cancer and all that. You've got all that because of the fallen world in which we live. And then fall on you. It's always the other person that sins, right? It's always the other guy, you know. They're the, they're, they're the problem. But you and I create our problems, too. We make the bed that we lie in. And we are ultimately responsible for our lives. So fall on you. I want to submit to you that many people, if you doubt the existence of evil, I want to share with you very quickly a story that was in the New York Times. 
I want to offer a trigger warning, especially to those of you that have, that have kids in the service right now. Trigger warning, this is a very difficult story. I'm going to go through it quickly. But this is an example of the reality of evil. The New York Times ran a story that this reporter talked about in his, uh, he was tweeting. And he said, for months, my colleague and I have been investigating one of the darkest, most depraved topics I've ever encountered, online child sexual abuse, also known as child pornography, which we find deeply troubling. Images and videos of children, yes, infants and toddlers being tortured, sexually abused, so on and so forth. Last year, over 45 million images and videos were reported to the Federal Clearinghouse. That's 120,000 every day, 85 every minute. Every single image or video is documentation of a crime and all are beyond the pale. I've read descriptions of abuse that were previously unfathomable to me. They rocked me to my core. They raised fundamental questions about humanity. Evil is real. Don't ever question that. You just have to turn on the news. And every day there's a parade of new depravity going on in our world today. Where children are being mistreated and tortured. You've got the sins of racism and slavery, slavery existing even right now in our world. Murder and mass shootings and all of this. Do you think for a moment that all of this is an accident? Do you understand for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, that not all of the sin taking place in the world can be explained by evolution? Evolution, if you just take an evolutionary mindset, evolution is about the survival of the fittest. And so you can argue that some of the sins are, are the result of <clears throat> one species trying to compete, you know, people trying to compete with each other to survive. But that cannot account for all the sin in the world today. There is some sin that takes place in the world today that goes way beyond that. Where it literally is just someone enjoying and taking pleasure in wickedness. Utter, evil wickedness. I could give you examples, and if we didn't have a mixed audience with children, I would, but we do. But I've known police officers. I know police officers, and I've known police officers. And one of my friends is a dear, was a dear friend of mine. is a police officer in Fairfax County, and some of the things that he told me that he saw makes my blood boil. Evil is real. It's real. And the Apostle Paul tells us where it comes from. Ultimately, evil comes from a supernatural force. A supernatural force, the devil and his demons. And many Christians are walking along today completely unaware of it and unequipped and not knowing how to deal with it. Jesus warns that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come, Jesus says, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You know what I find interesting? The number one reason that men and women walk away from the Christian faith today is because of the reality of pain and suffering. For, for years, people can't understand how a good and loving God would allow pain and suffering to happen in the world, even though the Bible explains why that's the case. Most people, however, are not rationally minded, and they think very much driven by emotion, and they don't even read and study the Bible. They just they see evil. They react against it. They don't want it. They don't understand how a good God could let it happen. Well, what I find interesting is the devil has succeeded in deceiving the human race to such an extent that people no longer really believe in the devil as a real being. And guess who they blame evil on? Isn't that interesting? how he has twisted it so much. In fact, there are mainline, mainline Protestant Christian denominations that teach the devil is not real. He's twisted it so much that even Christians in churches don't believe the devil's real. So if the devil's not real, guess who gets the blame for evil? God does. And the devil, as they say, is laughing all the way to the bank on that. Because it's exactly what he wants. But Jesus tells us here 
God is not the source of evil. Now, I understand the sovereignty of God. I get that. I understand that God overall governs the universe. I get that. I understand that. But the Bible teaches that the source of evil is Satan. He is the evil one. That's what the Bible teaches. And, and Jesus also tells you that the, that the motivation of the devil is to destroy, to kill, to steal, to destroy. He hates us. He hates us because God loves us. One of my favorite movies as a kid, Superman 2. How many of you have seen that? Okay. Christopher Reeves, the best Superman. All right. And uh, there's a great battle at the end there. He's fighting Zod and Zod's minions and stuff. And, and he throws one of them through a Coca-Cola sign. It was awesome and stuff. You know, so. Um, but at one point, um, this is like early 80s special effects. You have to understand when you're in the theater in the early 80s, you know, before all the CGI stuff, but to see that guy get thrown through a Coca-Cola sign was just awesome. It's like, this is cool, you know. Anyway, so, um, but at one point there, the, the, the Zod and his minions are talking, and Zod says, I know what his weakness is. He cares about these people. And then they begin to attack the innocent bystanders that are there. And Superman leaves to avoid any more harm to people. And the fact is, that's Jesus' weakness. He loves you and me. The devil hates us. He hates us because God made us in his image. And he hates us and wants to destroy us. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you so much he laid his life down for you. Jesus wants you, not, not doesn't want to take things from you. He wants you to have an abundant life. And isn't it interesting that many people today have the impression that God is a killjoy, <clears throat> that God wants to take things from you, that God, God wants you to have a miserable life. Nothing can be further from the truth. God wants you to be full of joy and abundance. God wants you, and when I say abundance, I don't mean, you know, like you're going to have a private jet and everything. I'm not talking about that, okay? All right, I'm, so don't, don't misquote me or misunderstand me. I'm just saying that God wants you to, because think about it, money is just one tangible thing, and money's going to pass away. That's not the abundance that God is promising. God promises to give you what you need to accomplish with the work he's called you to do. <clears throat> so if God's called you to do something that requires lots of money, then he will give you that money. And many of you, I know, are hoping he will, right? But remember, to whom much is given, much is required. So if God blesses you with lots of money and wealth and talents and abilities and stuff like that, much is required of you. Thankfully, I can take stock of the fact he hasn't blessed me with a lot of that stuff. So therefore, you know, not as much is required of me. <laughs> uh, but but God, God is interested in you having a joyful life, but the devil wants you miserable. He hates you. He wants to kill and destroy and take from you. And you need to be aware of that. Now... Before I get there, in um, Ezekiel and Isaiah, we get some insights as to how the devil came about and who the devil is. Now, these, uh, these great men of God were, were doing prophecies, writing out prophecies, and they begin their prophecies by talking about earthly rulers. And in the case of Isaiah, which we're going to look at, Isaiah is talking about the king of Babylon. But then in the middle of that prophecy, he switches, and he begins to talk about someone else, a power behind the human throne. Now, this is an interesting, interesting theology here, and I, I don't have time, unfortunately, to chase it too much, but there's a cool story in the book of Daniel, and where Daniel goes out to pray and fast, and Daniel ends up fasting for 21 days. And at the end of that 21-day fast, an unnamed angel appears to him, and this angel tells him, God heard your prayer on the first day and sent me to deliver a message to you on that first day. Now, if I were Daniel, just speak this in mind, fasting for 21 days, it's hard sometimes for me to fast for 21 minutes. <laughs> 21 hours, that is really difficult, okay? Going without, without food, any food at all, for 21 hours, whew, that's hard, okay? 21 days, wow. So I, I gotta admit, I'm, I'm Daniel, and I'm fasting for 21 days, and, and then the angel shows up and says, God heard your fast, heard your prayer, and your fast on the first day. I'd be like, where you been? You know, 
Where are you been? Okay. Well, the angel tells Daniel where he was. The angel says, I was dispatched that first day, but for three weeks I've been battling the evil force behind Babylon. Now, that's interesting because basically there is a supernatural battle taking place between fallen angels and God's angels that you and I don't even see and don't even know about. But our prayers affect that supernatural battle. And, and it's also interesting that there's a hierarchy of some kind with, amongst the angels and amongst the demons. And the Bible does talk about the hierarchy of the cherubims and so forth and so forth. But, but in this hierarchy, apparently, not only are there demons out there tormenting you and me and, and uh, coming after our families and so forth, but there's also apparently higher level demons that go after entire regions and entire nations. And the one that was in charge of, of, of manipulating and controlling and going after Babylon, that was the one that this angel fought on his way to meet Daniel. I wonder what the dark force is that's after America today. And I wonder if we really think about that, maybe you and I should spend more time on our knees praying for our country than we do. Well, uh, when, the, when the prophet Isaiah is talking about the, uh, the prophet, they're talking about this earthly ruler, he then switches his prophecy and begins to talk about someone else. We see this in Isaiah chapter 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I'm going to stop there and say this is <clears throat> the prophet Isaiah under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> telling us how Lucifer fell. Lucifer was a top angel, and he wanted to be like God. Pride. Pride. The sin that started it all. Pride. I like this part, though, because Isaiah is quoting Lucifer, saying, you said all these things. You said you're going to be great. You're going to be like the most high. You're going to be blah, 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 blah. Well, this is what's really going to happen to you. Yet you shall be brought down to Shoal, to the lowest depths of the pit. So basically, Isaiah giving Lucifer a reality check at that point. Um, so we are on the winning side. And Lucifer is going down in the end. But right now, he's causing a lot of trouble. The Bible describes Satan or Lucifer in many different ways. There's a few sampling of their references to the, to the devil in the Bible. He's called Satan in Job, Zechariah in the Gospels, Beelzebub in Matthew and Luke, the God of this world in 2 Corinthians, the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians, the wicked one in Matthew and 1 John. He is called the enemy in Matthew and Luke. He is called a murderer by Jesus in John and a father of lies by Jesus in John, a, not just a father, but the father of lies. He is the tempter. He is the great dragon. <clears throat> He is also an adversary and a roaring lion, among many names. There are others, the accuser of the brethren, others. Again, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I want to close because I don't believe it's good to just read a verse in isolation. So I'm going to quickly run through the context on this verse as we wrap up today to give you an idea of a theme that I hope you'll see. I hope this theme jumps out at you, and it's the key on how we can deal with the devil effectively. Take this context. We go back to the beginning of chapter 5 in 1 Peter, and Peter writes this. Now, he, he's writing a letter to Christians, obviously, and here he decides to focus on church people, and he starts by talking about elders. The elders who are among you, I exhort. Now, an elder is a pastor, and we just recently... Uh, ordained or elected uh, Pastor Charles and Pastor Kurt, formerly as elders of our church. Uh, an elder is a pastor. 
The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder, in other words, I'm a fellow pastor, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, I'm an apostle, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. I'm a Christian, all right? I'm, I'm going to heaven with you guys. I'm going to be there. So, now, so this Peter's laying out his resume here. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. That's where we get the word bishop from. Not by compulsion, but willingly. In other words, pastors shouldn't be forced to be pastors. It should be a real calling where the pastor is like, I can't see myself doing anything else. Where They're, they're passionate about it. Um, not for dishonest gain. Now, can we agree that there are some pastors out there who are in the ministry for the wrong reasons? And, and this, there's going to be an accountability here. There's going to be a reckoning. Because a pastor is not supposed to be in the ministry for dishonest gain. Um, keep that in mind, by the way, when you have a televangelist tell you that if you send in a certain donation, they're going to send you a prayer cloth that they prayed over, and that you're going to then get blessed with great wealth and abundance. That is, um, there are a lot of people out there that are very gullible and being taken advantage of. Uh, there, there should not be a charge, you know, for the gospel of Christ in that sense, all right? All right, so dishonest gain, but eagerly. Uh, again, passionately, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. In other words, I as a pastor am not supposed to lord it over you that I'm a pastor. Um, I, someone once said to me I should have a parking spot here, and I said if I asked the trustees for a parking spot, they'd, they'd put it way out there in the corner probably, you know. So, uh, uh, but, you know but basically when, you, when, when a pastor is emphasizing all the trappings and privileges uh, and emphasizing, you know, kind of lording it over being a dictator, you're not supposed to do that. Um, but being examples to the flock. So a pastor should lead first and foremost by example. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Uh, by the way, see, you all, um, I'm going to say one thing that might sound like I'm lording, I'm not. But you all, you only get to give an account to Jesus in one sense, that is for your own life. I get to give an account in two senses. I get to give an account for me and my life, but also how I pastor this church. And uh, that's, that's high accountability. Ultimately, I'm accountable to God for how I pastor this church. Um, and so that's convicting. Um, then it goes on, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. There is a, there, it's taught in Scripture that younger people should respect their elders, should respect those who are older. Uh, and, and that means for us, even only Baptist Church here, those of you who are younger, you need to respect and honor the older Christians in this church. And we are blessed with some wonderful senior saints in this church. You need to respect your elders. I say that as I'm starting to become more and more of an elder myself. You know, So, uh, uh, so uh, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Then he bronze it out and says, for that matter, all of you, submit to one another. One of the biggest problems in the church today is a word called ego. <clears throat> ego. We are to put our ego, which is our sense of self-esteem and self-importance, we are to put our ego aside. Because we're not here for us. We're here for him. Um, be submissive. Be clothed with humility. That means we got to put humility on every day. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Have you seen the theme yet? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care, all your worries, all your burdens on him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in this world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Note, the theme, the best way for us to resist the devil is to be humble, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, to remember that we are here for 
God and not for ourselves, to humble ourselves and rely on his strength. This passage also teaches us that we should expect to suffer as Christians. One of the biggest problems I have with the so-called prosperity gospel is it holds out this idea, this promise, that as long as you follow these seven steps, everything's going to be great. Life's going to be wonderful. But here, Peter is telling you, after you have suffered a while, expect to suffer as a Christian. The devil will be attacking you. The enemy will be coming after you. Expect to suffer. But that does, it doesn't end there. God promises to establish, strengthen, and settle you. And the home, the glory that will be revealed, is not worthy to be compared with anything that we have in this world today. I know it's hard, and sometimes we can feel overwhelmed by the evil in this world. But I want to close on a very good note as the praise team comes forward. And that is found... In the, by the Apostle John in 1 John 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, the dark forces, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We are on the winning side. We're on the winning team. We're on Team Jesus. We do not need to worry about the devil, but we do need to be aware of him. But we do not need to fear him. We need to fear God and humble ourselves under his mighty hand. And that is how we most effectively deal with the devil and overcome the traps he puts before us. And that's how we can best serve Jesus, the winning side. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for how wonderful and awesome you are. I thank you that you are worthy of our worship. I thank you that you are worthy of our love. Father, may we love you with our whole heart. May we trust you with our whole being. May we put aside our egos and our, our own tastes and preferences and all of that. May we instead come before you, humble ourselves before you, and recognize that we are here for you and your kingdom. If anyone here today has a burden that they want to lay at your feet, Lord, this invitation is for them. If anyone needs to make a decision, Lord, for church membership or baptism or salvation, Lord, this invitation certainly is for them. We commit it to your honor and glory alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll please stand. So